presentations, but this is a new thing doing these all virtually. So I'm used to being able to see who my audience is and such. And right now I can't really see you because I've got to be looking at the screen that you will be looking at too, but you can see me. Um, normally we would have cookies and coffee or juice or something like that. And it would be pretty informal, but we'll go ahead and get started. You can see that I will have this little pointer here on my screen so that I'll be able to move that around and I'll be able to highlight some things uh, on this uh, uh, on the screen as I go. So our topic tonight is benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is very well known as BPH. Okay, that's what I look like, but you can see what I look like anyway. That's my address again and phone number so you can reach me. So here's kind of what we'll cover. We're gonna cover what a prostate is and overview what that is, overview of what BPH is, and then we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the treatments, okay? So first of all, just looking at what the prostate is or prostate overview, this is a side view of the male anatomy. What you can see is towards the top of the slide is your bladder, and then right beneath that is the prostate, okay? Which is right here. And the urine goes down through the middle of the prostate, out the urethra, and out the tip of the penis. Now, the prostate starts out small and grows throughout our life. It spends some time where it's basically the same time in the 20s and 30s, and then starts to grow again in your 40s. Okay, but you can see that it is greatly affected by the urine stream, uh, or the urine stream is greatly affected by the prostate, I should say. So... What can happen to the prostate? Well, certain things, not just BPH, which is benign prostatic enlargement, but other things can happen to the prostate. Prostatitis, which is an infection, can happen. Prostate cancer can also happen, which is why you need a doctor, you need a urologist to help you figure these things out. So let's talk about BPH. Let's start by breaking down the word BPH. What, is the, what do the three initials stand for? Well, what you can see, the B, which is very important, stands for benign. That means it's not cancerous. Prostatic means it's something benign relating to the prostate. And hyperplasia means more than normal cells. Again, the prostate is growing. It's one of the bad things about being a man. You know, we lose our hair and our prostate grows and largely due to the same hormonal activity. But that's why we call it BPH, the enlargement of the prostate. And as you see in this bottom bullet point, it can cause some of the symptoms that we're going to talk about, including obstructive symptoms, lower urinary tract symptoms, which we'll talk about as we go along. So, well, if I have BPH, does that mean I have prostate cancer? And this is an important uh, distinction that I think you need to know. No, okay, BPH is not prostate cancer. BPH does not cause prostate cancer. Just because the prostate is growing and it's bigger doesn't mean it's a cancerous growth. Remember that B stands for benign, but there can be similar symptoms. So again, that's why you can't make the distinction. You need somebody else to do that. And you can have both. You can have BPH and prostate cancer. We do use PSA to help us distinguish that, but it's important to know that PSA is elevated in both. BPH and prostate cancer. In fact, more commonly elevated in BPH, but needs to be evaluated to be sure it's just BPH, not prostate cancer. So again, that's what you need my help from or another physician. Now, this is a diagram similar to the one we looked at on the very first page showing the anatomy again. On the left here is a normal sized prostate. And you can see the urine is able to freely flow through the urethra and out the tip of the penis. On the right here, you can see is an enlarged prostate, okay? And what you can see is this channel is being squeezed, okay? And that will cause various symptoms, okay? Now, there are things that you need to know, and that is one of the things is just because the prostate is big does not necessarily correlate with the degree of symptoms. Some people can have a bigger prostate right around the urethra, and some people can have a bigger prostate that does not affect the urethra. So, just because you've been told you have a big prostate, if you're not having symptoms, does not necessarily mean you have to have treatment. So what are these symptoms? Well, this isn't my slide, obviously, but I like the most important symptom that affects that I think affects most men is this one down here, the weak stream. And we've talked about it already because it's being squeezed by that prostate. And so that's a weak stream. 
Or when you have a weak stream, sometimes you can get more frequent urination because you're not emptying the bladder down here, not emptying the bladder. And then you can get the sudden urge to urinate because the prostate, as you saw, can kind of push into the bladder, causing it to be a little irritated. Burning can happen, trouble starting the urine. And this last one is the one we want to try to avoid, inability to urinate, meaning, honey, suddenly I can't pee, I've got to go to the hospital. And that usually entails a traumatic experience at the emergency room getting a catheter. And that's what we want to try to avoid. So that's why these symptoms are all very important uh, for us to, to work through to try to help you determine what is best for you. So these are just some statistics. And it just basically is saying that, you know, 95% of men who have moderate BPH don't want to live that way for the rest of their lives, nor should they have to, especially in modern medical therapy. And it affects 50% affects of people's normal life, and sometimes it even affects their sexual uh, symptoms. Again, more statistics. It's the most common problem in men over 50. This is 2010, 14 million men were thought to have symptoms of lower urine tract infection. And what you can see is if you're in your 50s or 60s, about 50% of men are gonna have that, and 90% of men in their 80s. So how do we make the diagnosis? How do we know that it's uh, uh, enlarged? Well, a lot of it is based upon this very first one, the history, what you tell your doctor. Believe it or not, we can work through these problems pretty much from that alone. But there are other things we wanna do. We wanna do a prostate exam, which is the dreaded digital rectal exam, finger up the bottom. But we're also gonna check the urine. We're gonna check some, maybe some testing about how the urine is coming out, how fast it's coming out, having you pee in a special toilet, we're going to check a post void urine, which means after you urinate, how much do you still have in the bladder? We do that thankfully with an ultrasound. And then an additional dot that's not here that we might do is we might do a telescope where we look inside the penis and actually look at the prostate and bladder and see what's happening on the inside. We also have these questionnaires. Okay. So these are nice because these questionnaires you fill out in your convenience, and it gives us an idea of where you are. And it can also give us an idea after your treatment. So if you're a 30 before and you're a 15 after, you can imagine that's a great deal of improvement. So it gives us an idea sometimes of how well you're doing. So what are the treatment options? Well, this is kind of a big page showing all the treatment options, but we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this page. It's just mainly to show you that we're gonna go from less aggressive to more aggressive. We're gonna spend a majority of our time in this area because these are first line treatments, okay? And we'll spend the majority of the time in that area. So first one is behavior modification, okay? Actually, I'm gonna go back one. Uh, actually, no, I'm gonna go forward. So are there any, patients always say, doctor, is there anything in my diet or any herb or, you know, anything I can take, red tomatoes, you know, you've heard all these things, saw palmetto included, you know, there have been many studies that show it does not necessarily really affect the progression or the treatment of BPH, okay? So nothing that you can do in your diet or herbally to, to uh, help with that. But you can watch this, okay? Not everybody who has BPH symptoms needs to do anything about it. But what should you do? Well, you should watch it. You should have yearly exams. Obviously, there's no surgery or drugs involved. There are some lifestyle modifications that you might do. You know, you might change your fluid intake. That's probably the biggest one that patients will do. Um, they'll, they'll decrease taking fluid in the evening because they don't want to be getting up at night to urinate. But obviously, the side effect of this, there's no real side effect, the main side effect is that the symptoms may worsen over time. So that's okay because you can always go to something else, which is what we're gonna talk about next. Medications. Most doctors, when you first see them are gonna recommend medications, which I highly recommend too. When I first meet a patient, if I say, let's go cut on you right now, most of them are gonna be very leery of that. And I think that's appropriate, especially when we have medications. So this is what's called alpha blockers. And how does this work? What is it? So all of these slides are gonna have kind of, what is it? Is general anesthesia required, permanent implant and potential side effects? So we'll go down all these things on each of the treatments. Well, this is a pill basically that it takes that basically relaxes the bladder and prostate, allowing the urine to come out. So you can imagine if I kind of pulled that prostate apart with this medication and let you urinate better. 
Nice thing is there's no anesthesia, there's no permanent implant, but there are some side effects. It can lower your blood pressure a little bit, especially some of the non-specialized ones. It can cause a little bit of dizziness, some fatigue, it can make your nose a little bit stuffy. And there's uh, some sexual side effects with retrograde ejaculation. Now, in this day and age, there are lots of people that don't wanna take medications. You don't have to take medications forever. Even if I start you on that at first, we can always go to other things. So, but it's getting to know each other, getting a trust, developing that doctor patient relationship. Another class of medication is called a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. This pill actually shrinks the prostate. And you say, Dr. Glass, that sounds wonderful. Shrink my prostate. That's what I want. Get me back to where I was 20 years old. But there are some side effects of this. It does use a blocking of a male hormone called dihydrotestosterone, not testosterone, to shrink it. It takes time. In fact, it's a very slow process over six months to two years to really see improvement. So you have to use those questionnaires like we were talking about to really see if you're improving because it's hard to remember what it was like, what I was urinating like six months ago compared to what I was urinating like yesterday. And so it takes time. And so patients need to be shown that they actually are improving. And down here again, no anesthesia, no implant, but there are some side effects. It is gonna lower your PSA because it's shrinking the prostate. So sometimes we have to be really careful and you need to be sure that you're telling your doctor, I'm on this medication. Um, can cause some erectile dysfunction, some lowered sex drive and ejaculation. Young men don't really like this medication, okay? And many men don't like this medication. Um, so next, we're talking about getting away from medications. This is a great therapy. It's called water vapor therapy. I'm not gonna use the trade name for it, but it's a very good therapy. What is water vapor therapy? Well, it's basically turning water into steam right up here, they'll say to shrink the prostate. Okay, so we're basically gonna inject steam into the prostate and thereby reduce the tissue that's right around the urethra. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we pass a little telescope into the prostate and we will steam different segments of the prostate. Okay, we call these treatments, different treatments of the prostate. And those treatments take, the steaming takes about nine seconds, okay? And during that nine seconds, you're gonna feel some pain. It's gonna feel a lot like, you, like that urge to go. Like I wanna stop the car on the highway and go to the bathroom. It's gonna feel some burning. But the good news is, is that after nine seconds and you know, most patients will get you roughly around six treatments, again, all at the same time. You know, that's six times nine, that's 56 seconds. So you're talking about less than a minute of discomfort, okay? There is no anesthesia required. It's done in the office. There's nothing implanted. So that's wonderful. And if you look here, the surgical retreatment or the need for additional treatment over four years is very low. So it's got a nice longevity. And you say four years, well, that's because this is not... We haven't been doing this treatment forever. I'd say I've been doing it about maybe five years. Um, but um, it is a very, very effective treatment. Now, what are some of the potential side effects? Down here, you are going to need a catheter for a couple of days. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, and the main reason is because the steam causes swelling. And that swelling causes the tissue to even more block the urine flow. So we want to put that catheter in. Let you have time to, to get better. And so there will be some pain and discomfort, especially in the first three weeks. The first one to two, three weeks, you're like, well, I don't know if I should have done this, but then at one month, two months, three months, and even four months, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm better and better and better, okay? You can see some blood in the urine and semen during that. You know, we've done it, we've been inside your urethra, so there's always a chance for, for an infection. But this is a great, great treatment. I think once we, as we compare the other treatments, you'll see looking at some of the numbers as to what this does and why I like it so much. The next one, also a very good treatment is called prostatic urolift or prostatic urethral lift, okay? And what this is, again, is a non-surgical treatment, but you are putting permanent implants. Down here is a little diagram of the prostate. Okay, remember how it was, it was squeezing on this urethra? Well, now we've taken these little kind of bands of the little metal bands, and we've basically pulled the prostate open like a curtain. You can see how this picture looks like a curtain. So I've pulled the prostate open like a curtain, um, and it's holding it open. Well, um, that's great. Again, no anesthesia required, but there is a permanent implant in there. 
the surgical retreatment rate is a little bit higher, and I'll explain to you why. The prostate's going to continue to grow. We haven't done anything to shrink it or destroy tissue or remove tissue as we did with the water vapor. We actually destroyed the tissue with the steam and the body slowly brought away that tissue from your body. So the prostate's continue to grow. So sometimes what you'll see is this will just start to grow over this. And so these little areas will just start to grow into this area where the urine is even more what I call pillowing. Like when you put your head on a pillow and the pillow comes up around your head, it'll just continue to go around your head if you had a bigger and deeper pillow. Um, but some of the side effects are blood in the urine, pain, increased urgency to go because you've got something in there, okay? And some patients will have discomfort in their, in their pelvis. But this is a very good treatment. I would say better with some of the smaller prostates, okay? This one, transurethral microwave therapy, I'll be honest with you. I don't think anybody's doing this anymore. I'm not doing this anymore. We used microwave to basically heat the prostate and destroy tissue. It just wasn't as effective. And so I'm going to kind of skip over this one. Now we're going to more of the aggressive therapies. And when I mean aggressive, I mean this bullet right here. These are going to be the ones that require anesthesia. So, you know, you probably want to think about that before you move right into these. And the good news is, is you can try some of these other therapies and still be able to go to this treatment. So you're not precluded from going to this treatment just because you're, you've had the microwave, I mean, you've had the vapor therapy or you've had the, uh, the prostatic urethral lift procedure. Neither of those preclude you from using this procedure. So what is it? Well, we use a laser to basically vaporize the tissue that's right around the urethra, okay? It's typically done as an outpatient setting, which makes it very good. And the laser, one of the benefits of the laser is this one right here, minimal blood loss. Believe it or not, the prostate is a very vascular organ. And so bleeding is one of the biggest risk factors for major surgery on the prostate, which is why we don't take it lightly and why patients who are in an elderly category sometimes don't do as well because they bleed too much. Um, nice thing about this, there is rapid improvement right after the procedure because you are vaporizing. There is some irritation for a couple of months, but again, it does require general anesthesia. There's no permanent implant. You can see the surgical retreatment rate is again, pretty low, which is great. And these side effects, some patients will have some more urgency and frequency because after we vaporize that prostate in this manner, it can cause some irritation. Blood in the urine is certainly common urinary retention immediately after just from the swelling, and then the retrograde ejaculation, which means the urine, the, the semen that you have when you have an ejaculation is going backwards into the bladder. This is the tried and true. This is called TERP, transurethral resection of the prostate. This is what we used to call the gold standard for, um, for prostate uh, surgery. It's the roto-rooter job, okay? We're actually using a little metal loop like this down here to basically trim the prostate tissue out, okay? It does require oftentimes hospitalization. I'd say not always, but there are times where you will stay overnight. So it's not really quoted as hospitalization. It's called observation. Um, and um, uh, you will... Uh, uh, see symptom relief pretty soon. There's some burning as the tissue heals and that can last for sometimes a couple of months. It does require this general anesthesia, no permanent implant, and you can see retreatment rates. But there are some side effects, nausea, vomiting, especially if the sur surgery, restlessness, retention can happen where the, it doesn't, you, we don't take out enough. You can get scarring in this. Some patients do have to have prolonged catheterization. Um, you can have bleeding, even required transfusion, okay? So like I said, this is not a small operation, which is why these previous things that I've described are really so beneficial. I would say we don't do this as much as we used to. There's no question. Open prostatectomy. Open prostatectomy is really reserved for some of the biggest prostates. Prostates can grow to be the size of a grapefruit or an orange. And when you have a prostate that big, it's hard for any of these other therapies to take out enough tissue to really make it beneficial. So this is an open surgery where we actually make a cut. So you can see the knife on your abdomen. We are doing it with a robot now through the belly button, but we can actually do that, but usually requires hospitalization for one to four days um, and does have a significant risk of blood transfusion in this situation. 
Okay, so this is really reserved for that giant prostate, um, which hopefully none of you have, but if you do, we can always help you with that. So, you know, I, I don't know anything about the particular insurance coverage, but that's something we or any office will work through with, work, work through with you. Um, so here's a summary of what we covered. We talked about how the prostate works. We talked about what BPH was. We talked about just watching it. We talked about some of the first line therapies, which included medical, the water vapor, the permanent implant. We didn't talk about microwave because it's not really used. And we talked about the laser and the TERP and the open prostatectomy. So in, anytime you're really thinking that you want something done with this, you certainly can see a urologist. Um, we are some of the best at being able to differentiate what is best for you and work through that because no one patient fits any mold. So we know that each patient is an individual and what works for one patient may not work for every patient. So with that, I think we'll take any questions. Perfect. Um, if anyone has questions, you can enter them in the chat box. Um, we'll wait a couple minutes and Dr. Glass will be available if you have any specific questions about your, um, your condition. Dr. Glass, I'll ask one because this one comes up quite a bit, but how soon after one of the minimally invasive uh, procedures, can you get back to, you know, kind of a normal life, back to work, back to exercise, back to sex? Great question. Most of the time you can get back to work with work and these sorts of things within two to three days. Um, and that's, what's so nice about them. You don't have the effects of the anesthesia and the, the lingering kind of feeling of having been put to sleep and the sore throat and all that. And most of those will slowly let you improve over time. So it's not taking such a big shock on your body and therefore lets you just kind of slowly get better over a period of time, but also lets you go back to more normal activity um, right away. Great question. We have a question here. At what age does a man need to start having their prostate checked? Great question. Um, so the guidelines for that are right now, you should start having your prostate checked at age 50, which includes the digital rectal exam, which is the finger up the bottom and a PSA. Now, the caveat of that is if you have a family history, if you have a first degree relative who has prostate cancer, which will be father, brother, uncle, then you should get checked at 40, okay? And a lot of people, and I'm one of these people because I think we, we need to know more about prostate cancer or know that you may have it. They might get a baseline, even if they're not 50, they might just get a baseline at 40 and say, let me just make sure it's okay at 40 and then I'll do it again at 50. So that's certainly okay too. And that's a discussion you can have with your doctor or your urologist. Great question. And at, at Dr. Glass, I believe you touched on this, but if you've already had a prostate procedure, something done, um, what is the availability to have something else done? Like, how does that typically work? So great question, Julie. Um, it really, it really depends upon the anatomy of what happened to you and what's happened to your prostate. So I'm not going to say any of the things are off limits. Um, if you've had the, the urethral lift procedure, you can still have the water vapor um, and vice versa. There are some things that make you not able to have the uh, water vapor, specifically having had seeds, radiation seeds for prostate cancer. But otherwise, if you've had something done to your prostate, um, one of the other procedures, and you, you want to move to a different one, most of the time you can. Thank you. I actually did not know about the seeds myself. So yes. <laughs> interesting. 
Great. Well, I think we, um, I think that's all for questions. So thank you so much for your time, Dr. Glass. We, um, everyone on the call, this, this will be available afterwards. Um, Dr. Glass will work on sharing it with everyone who's attended. Um, and of course, reach out if you have any questions specifically um, for Dr. Glass. Thank you for your attention. Stay warm and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye-bye.